Hello Greenwich, I'm Mrs. Penman. I teach second grade, as many of you know, and I'll be reading chapter 11, Bruce Bogtrotter and the Cake. My class is here with me to listen to the story and get a little sneak preview ahead. I might clarify a few things as I'm reading to my second graders, so please be patient with those little explanations. All right, so the chapter is called Bruce Bogtrotter and the Cake. How can she get away with it? Lavender said to Matilda. Surely the children go home and tell their mothers and fathers. I know my father would raise a terrific stink if I told him the headmistress had grabbed me by the hair and slung me over the playground fence. No, he wouldn't, Matilda said, and I'll tell you why. He simply wouldn't believe you. Of course he would. He wouldn't, Matilda said, and the reason is obvious. Your story would sound too ridiculous to be, be believed. And that is the Trunchbull's great secret. What is? Lavender asked. Matilda said, never do anything by halves if you want to get away with it. Be outrageous. Go the whole hog. Make sure everything you do is so completely crazy, it's just unbelievable. No parent is going to believe this pigtail story, not in a million years. Mine wouldn't. They'd call me a liar. In that case, Lavender said, Amanda's mother isn't going to cut her pigtails off. No, she isn't, Matilda said. Amanda will do it herself. You see if she doesn't. Do you think she's mad, Lavender asked? Who? The Trunchbull. No, I don't think she's mad, Matilda said, but she's very dangerous. Being in this school is like being in a cage with a cobra. You have to be fast on your feet. They got another example of how dangerous the headmistress could be on the very next day. During lunch, an announcement was made that the whole school should go into the assembly hall and be seated as soon as the meal was over. When all the 250 or so boys and girls were settled down in assembly, the trunch bowl marched on the platform. None of the other teachers came in with her. She was carrying a riding crop in her right hand. She stood up there on center stage in her green breeches with legs apart and riding crop in hand, glaring at the sea of upturned faces before her. How do you think they're feeling? Pretty scared. What's going to happen, Lavender whispered. I don't know, Matilda whispered back. The whole school waited for what was coming next. Bruce Bogtrotter, the trench ball barked suddenly. Where is Bruce Bogtrotter? A hand shot up among the seated children. Come up here, the trench ball shouted, and look smart about it. An 11-year-old boy who was decidedly large and round stood up and waddled briskly forward. He climbed up onto the platform. Stand over here, the trench ball ordered, pointing, and the boy stood to one side. He looked nervous. He knew very well he wasn't up there to be presented with a prize. He was watching the headmistress with exceedingly wary eye, and he kept edging farther and farther away from her with little shuffles of his feet, rather as a rat might edge away from a terrier that is watching it from across the room. His plump, flabby face had turned gray with fearful apprehension. His stockings hung about his ankles. This clot, boomed the headmistress, pointing the riding crop right at him like a rapier. This black head, this foul carbuncle, this poisonous pustule that you see before you is none other than a disgusting criminal, a denizen of the underworld, a member of the mafia. <laughs> Who, me? What's Bruce Bogtrotter said, looking genuinely puzzled. Ah. Uh, Thief, the trunchbull screamed. A crook, a pirate, a brigand, a rustler. Steady on, the boy said. I mean, dash it all, headmistress. Do you deny it, you miserable little gumboil? Do you plead not guilty? I don't know what you're talking about, the boy said, more puzzled than ever. I'll tell you what I'm talking about, you superating little blister, the trunch ball shouted. Yesterday morning during break, you sneaked like a little serpent into the kitchen and stole a slice of my private chocolate cake from my tea tray. That tray had just been prepared for me personally by the cook. It was my morning snack. And as for the cake, it was my own private stock. 
That was not a boy's cake. You don't think for one minute I'm going to eat the filth I give to you. That cake was made from real butter and real cream. And he, that robber bandit, that safe cracker, that highway man standing over there with his socks around his ankles, stole it and ate it. <laughs> I never did, the boy exclaimed, turning gray to white. Don't lie to me, Bog Trotter, barked the trunch bowl. The cook saw you. What's more, saw you eating it. The trunch bowl paused and to wipe a fleck of froth from her lips. When she spoke again, her voice was suddenly softer, quieter, more friendly, and she leaned towards the boy, smiling. You like my chocolate cake, don't you, Bog Trotter? It's rich and delicious, isn't it, Bog Trotter? Very good, the boy mumbled. The words were out before he could stop himself. You're right, the trumbull said. It is good. Therefore, I think you should congratulate the cook. When a gentleman has a particularly good meal, Bog Trotter, he always sends his compliments to the chef. You didn't know that, did you, Bog Trotter? But those who inhabit the criminal underworld are not noted for their good manners. The boy remained silent. Cook, the trench bowl shouted, turning her head towards the door. Cook, come here. Bog Trotter wishes to tell you how good your chocolate cake is. The cook, a tall, shriveled female who looked as though all of her body juices had been dried out uh, of her long ago in hot oven, walked onto the platform wearing a dirty white apron. Her entrance had clearly been arranged beforehand by the headmistress. Now then, Bog Trotter, the trunch ball boomed, tell the cook what you think of her chocolate cake. Very good, the boy mumbled. You could see he was now beginning to wonder what all this was leading up to. The only thing he knew for certain was that the law forbade the trunch bowl to hit him with the riding crop that she kept smacking against her thigh. That was some comfort, but not much because the trunch bowl was totally unpredictable. One never knew what she was going to do next. There you are, cook, the trunch bowl cried. Bog Trotter likes your cake. He adores your cake. Do you have any more of your cake you could give him? I do indeed, the cook said. She seemed to have learnt her lines by heart. Then go and get it and bring a knife to cut it with. The cook disappeared. Almost at once she was back again, staggering under the weight of this enormous round chocolate cake on a china platter. The cake was fully 18 inches in diameter and it was covered with dark brown chocolate icing. Put it on the table, the trunch bowl said. There was a small table center stage with a chair behind it. The cook placed the cake carefully on the table. Sit down, Bog Trotter, the trunch ball said. Sit here. The boy moved cautiously to the table and he sat down. He stared at the gigantic cake. There you are, Bog Trotter, the trunch ball said. And once again, her voice became soft, persuasive, even gentle. It's all for you, every bit of it. As you enjoyed that slice you had yesterday so very much, I ordered cake to bake you, cook to bake you an extra large one all for yourself. Well, thank you, the boy said, totally bemused or confused. Thank you, cook. Not confused. Not me, the trunch ball said. Thank you, cook, the boy said. The cook stood there like a shriveled bootlace, tight-lipped, impl implacable, disapproving. She looked as though her mouth was full of lemon juice. Come on then, the trunch ball said. Why don't you cut yourself a nice thick slice and just try it? What now, the boy said, cautious. He knew there was a catch in this somewhere, but he wasn't sure where. Can I take it home instead, he asked. That would be impolite, the trunch ball said with a crafty gr grin. You must show Cookie here how grateful you are for all the trouble that she's taken. The boy didn't move. Go on with it, get on with it, the trunch ball said. Cut a slice and taste it. We haven't got all day. The boy picked up the knife and was about to cut into the cake when he stopped. He stared at the cake. Then he looked up at the trunch ball, then at the tall, stringy cook with her lemon juice mouth. All the children in the hall were watching tensely, waiting for something to happen. 
They felt certain it must. The Trunchbull was not a person who would give someone a whole chocolate cake to eat just out of kindness. Many were guessing that it had been filled with pepper or castor oil or some other foul-tasting substance that would make the boy violently sick. It might even be arsenic. He would be dead in 10 seconds flat. Or perhaps it was a booby trap cake where the whole thing would blow up in one moment that it was caught, taking Bruce Bogtrotter with it. No one in the school put it past the trunch bowl to do any one of these things. I don't want to eat it, the boy said. Taste it, you little brat, the trunch bowl said. You're insulting the cook. Very gingerly, the boy began to cut a thin slice of the vast cake. Then he levered the slice out. Then he put down the knife and took the sticky thing in his fingers and started very slowly to eat it. Isn't it good, Trunchball asked. Very good, the boy said, chewing and swallowing, and he finished the slice. Have another, the Trunchball said. That's enough. Thank you, the boy murmured. I said have another, the Trunchball said. And now there was an altogether sharper edge to her voice. Eat another slice and do as you are told. I don't want another slice, the boy said. Suddenly, the trunch bowl exploded. Eat, she shouted, banging her thigh with a riding crop. If I tell you to eat, you will eat. You wanted cake, you stole that cake, and now you've got cake. What's more, you're going to eat it. You do not leave this platform and nobody leaves this hall until you have eaten the entire cake that is sitting in front of you. Do I make myself clear, Bog Trotter? Do you get my meaning? The boy looked at the trunch ball. Then he looked down at that enormous cake. Eat, 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 the trunch ball was yelling. Very slowly, the boy cut himself another slice, and he began to eat it. Matilda was fascinated. Do you think he can do it? She whispered to Lavender. No, Lavender whispered back. It's impossible. He'd be sick before he was halfway through. The boy kept going, and when he had finished the second slice, he looked at the trunch ball, hesitating. Eat, she shouted, greedy little thieves who like to eat cake must have cake. Eat faster, eat faster. We don't want to be here all day, and don't stop like you're doing now. Next time you stop before it's all finished, you'll go straight in the chokey, and I shall lock the door and throw the key down the well. The boy caught a third slice, and he started to eat. He finished this one quicker than the other two, and when that was done, he immediately picked up the knife and cut the next slice. In some peculiar way, he seemed to be getting into his stride. Matilda watched closely, closely and saw no signs of distress in this boy yet. If anything, he seemed to be gathering confidence as he went along. He's doing well, she whispered to Lavender. He'll be sick soon, Lavender whispered back. It's going to be horrid. When Bruce Bogtrotter had eaten his way through half of the entire enormous cake, he paused for a couple of seconds and took several deep breaths. The trunch bowl stood with hands on hips, glaring at him. Get on with it, she shouted. Eat it up. Suddenly, the boy let out a gigantic belch, which rolled around the assembly hall like thunder. Many of the audience began to giggle. Silence, shouted Trumball. The boy caught himself another thick slice and started eating it fast. There were still no signs flagging or giving up. He certainly did not look as though he was about to stop and cry out, I can't, I can't eat anymore. I'm going to be sick. He was still in the running. And now a subtle change was coming over the 250 watching children in the audience. Earlier on, they had sensed impending disaster. They had prepared themselves for an unpleasant scene in which the wretched boy stuffed to the gills with chocolate cake would have to surrender and beg for mercy. And then they would have watched the triumphant trunch ball forcing more and still more cake into the mouth of this gasping boy. Not a bit of it. Bruce Bogtrotter was three quarters of the way through and still going strong. One sensed that he was almost beginning to enjoy himself. 
He had a mountain to climb, and he was jolly well going to reach the top or die in an attempt. What is more, he had now become conscious of his audience and of how they were all silently rooting for him. This was nothing less than a battle between him and the mighty Trunchbull. Suddenly, someone shouted, Come on, Brucey, you can make it! The Trunchbull wheeled round and yelled, Silence! The audience watched intently. They were thoroughly caught up in the contest. They were longing to start cheering, but did they, they didn't dare. I think he's going to make it, Matilda whispered. I think so too, Lavender whispered back. I wouldn't have believed anyone in the world could eat the whole cake of that size. The Trunchbull doesn't believe it either, Matilda whispered. Look at her. She's turning redder and redder. She's going to kill him if he wins. The boy was slowing down. There was no doubt about that. But he kept pushing the stuff into his mouth with dogged perseverance of a long-distance runner who has sighted the finishing line and knows he must keep going. As the very last mouthful disappeared, a tremendous cheer rose up from the audience, and the children were leaping to, onto their chairs and yelling and clapping and shouting, Well done, Brucey! Good for you, Brucey! You've won a gold medal, Brucey! <laughs> The Trunchbull stood motionless on the platform. Her great, horsey face had turned the color of molten lava, and her eyes were glittering with fury. She glared at Bruce Boggs Trotter, who was sitting on his chair like some huge, overstuffed grub, replete, comatose, unable to move or to speak. Fine sweat was beating his forehead, but there was a grin of triumph on his face. Suddenly, the Trunchbull lunged forward and grabbed the large, empty china platter on which the cake had rested. She raised it high in the air and brought it down with a crash right on top of wretched Bog Trot Bruce Bog Trotter's head, and pieces flew all over the platform. The boy was by now so full of cake, he was like a sack full of wet cement, and you couldn't have hurt him with a sledgehammer. He simply shook his head a few times and went on grinning. Go to blazes, screamed the Trunchbull, and she marched off the platform, followed closely by the cook. <laughs> <laughs>